All right. Welcome and, and thank you all for joining us. Today, Levine Museum of the New South offers us with an interest in education history, a special treat. Um, as we get to hear from Andrew Failer and, and get a sneak peek at his latest photographic history work entitled A Better Life for Children. Um, initially, we were going to bring on um, local journalist, retired journalist, Fanny Flono to talk about the legacy of the um, local uh, Salon School, which is featured in Andrew Failer's work, um, but we'll bring her on at the end of the show. And I wanna talk just a little bit about Andrew Failer um, so you all know who he is. Um, he's a fifth generation Georgian um, who grew up in Savannah. Um, he uh, was shaped by the rich complexities of the American South. He has been active all across the state of Georgia in civic life, um, organizing dozen, dozens of community initiatives. Um, and his art is an extension of his civic values. Today, he's gonna talk a lot, he's, he's gonna talk a lot about his forthcoming book, A Better Life for the Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 schools that changed America. It's going to um, drop later this month and you can pick that up locally at Park Road Books. Um, this is his actually his second work. His first work um, was without regard to sex, race and color, and was also published by the University of Georgia. And it focused on the largely abandoned campus of the historically black college of Morris Brown. Um, Andrew's photographs have been featured in um, works and in um, ma magazines and publications like Slate, um, Oxford American, The Bitter Southerner, Ain't Bad, and, other, and, and, and numerous other newspapers, including um, NPR. His work has been displayed in galleries and museums across the country, including the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, um, the International Civil Rights Museum here in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the um, Octagon Museum in, in Washington, D.C. Um, he earned a bachelor's in economics from the Wharton School of Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, a master's degree in modern history from Oxford University, and his MBA from Stanford University. So I'd like to um, now take the time to welcome Andrew. Willie, thank you very much. It is great to join you all and share. Yeah. The, um, it has been quite the, the week since we have gotten this process started. Our first event was uh, last week on April 1st, uh, which happened to coincide with uh, opening day of the baseball season. Not, too many, not many authors get to have opening day of their book and opening day of the baseball season coincide. Uh, but we had a record turnout uh, for the book series at the Atlanta History Center. Um, the book, even before publication, has gone into a second printing, okay. and we have pieces coming out in uh, Smithsonian Magazine, the Wall Street Journal Weekend, uh, Architect Magazine, Preservation Magazine, uh, and the museum show that will accompany this book will open later in May at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights here in Atlanta, and then travel beyond. That's so. Um, it's, uh, it's shaping up to be quite the run. So I'll, I'll open for a little bit and to get set a little bit of stage, and then I'm gonna show you some of the photographs from this book and tell you some of the stories associated with some of those photographs. The Rosenwald Schools program is one of the most transformative developments in the first half of the 20th century in America. It, it, profoundly reshapes this nation. It profoundly reshapes the African-American experience, and yet it remains hidden history, and its scope and sweep is largely unknown. So with, with that as a simple introduction, I'm gonna um, go to uh, share screen here and tell you some of the stories of some of these images. Uh, I'm gonna open uh, these, I open with some historical images and uh, what I, I made a decision at the beginning of this process that the historical images, I wanted to actually shoot myself in the location because the location has meaning in this particular story. This is a portrait of Julius Rosenwald who hang, which hangs in the Noble Hill School in Bartow County, Georgia, which is about an hour north of Atlanta, up I-75 on the way towards Chattanooga. Julius Rosenwald was born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution. 
And he grew up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln when Abraham Lincoln was resident in Springfield, Illinois. Julius Rosenwald rises to become the president of Sears Roebuck and Company. He leads Sears from 1908 until his death in 1932, and he turns Sears into the world's largest retailer. Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, becomes one of the most prominent African-American voices of the late 19th and early 20th century. And he is the founding principal of the historically black college in Alabama known as known then as Tuskegee Institute. And this photograph of this, this portrait of him hangs in the president's house at what is now Tuskegee University. Now the two men meet in 1911. This is a rare portrait of the two men together printed on fabric and sewn into a quilt that was created to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School today. in the restored school. I think we're, we're having some, um, some connective issues right now. The, um, Andrew, are you still there? Give us a second. I, th I think we, we we lost you for a second, Andrew. Um, okay, where did you, where'd you lose me? Let's go back to the quilt. You were talking about the Pine Grove, um, the, the Pine Grove Day, I think, I believe. Yeah, the Pine Grove School? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? We yeah, okay? yeah, we're good now. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, That's so, okay. so uh, this, uh, this is a rare photograph of the two men together, printed on fabric and sewn into a quilt that was created to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School in Richland County, South Carolina. It was in it, at the rededication ceremony, former students, former teachers and their descendants were invited to sign the quilt and it hangs today in the restored schoolhouse. So, the two men meet in 1911. You have to remember that 1911 is before the Great Migration, which happens, starts later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. And public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks in terrible facilities with a fraction of the funding provided to, for the education of white children. And so the two men come up with this program in 1912 that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. And they reach out to the black communities of the South. And they say, if, can you hear me okay, Willie? I can hear you, you still hear okay, me. Okay, okay. They reach out to the black communities of the South. And they say, if you will contribute to a school because we want you to be a full partner in your progress, and we will count as your contribution, cash, land, material and labor, and if you will go to the school board, the white school board, because we, these will be must be public schools and the school board must agree to own, maintain and staff the schools, i.e. pay for the teachers. And we wanna be deliberate in creating black white dialogue. If you do those things, then Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution toward school construction. Now, I'm going to pause for a minute and tell a different story that's important related to this image. The Rosenwald Schools program begins with a pilot of six schools close to Tuskegee, where Booker T. Washington and his team can keep an eye on them. And he has photographs just like this made of the students and teachers standing proudly in front of their school. And he sends them to Julius Rosenwald, who writes back that he is so moved by these images that he is going to expand the program. And so because of that role that photography actually plays in the shaping of this program, 
these images, black and white and horizontal, led me to create this entire body of work, black and white and horizontal, to honor the role that these historic images played in the shaping of this program. And that is a fascinating story because I don't think I've studied a little bit about the Rosenwald schools. I don't think I've ever heard that story about the role that photographs have played um, in, in, you know, influencing uh, Rosenwald. Yeah. And as a photographer, the idea that, that photography actually shapes the history in such a profound right. way. I mean, these images, this image is made in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, these images are made throughout the program and they become this core visual language of the program. And what I was doing was honoring that visual language. Most of my, my bodies of my significant bodies of work have all been in color. This is the first body of work I've done in black and white in, in, in a very, very long time, but it, it was, it was the right, right, um, choice for this work. Okay, so he's reached out to the black communities. He has had them collaborate with the white school boards. And starting in 1912, when the community of Lochapoca, Alabama in Lee County starts to raise money for what becomes the very first Rosenwald School until 1937, when Franklin Rose, President Franklin Roosevelt presides over the dedication ceremony of the Eleanor Roosevelt School in Meriwether County, Georgia, 1912 to 1937, the program builds 4,978 schools across 15 states. Now you may have noticed that there's a different number on this schoolhouse construction map 5,357. The difference is that the fund also built some additional sh uh, industri shop space next to some of these schools for industrial education, what today we would call Botech, uh, and some teacher homes. And that is, that's how you get an additional roughly 350 buildings. You may see at times the number 5,300 schools. That's actually not accurate. It was about 5,300 buildings, mm -hmm. but it's 4,978 schools. Yeah, and a lot of the straight scholarship, they talk about just the 5,357. I was, yeah. Yeah. So this school, this program profoundly changes America. There are two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that there was a persistent black-white education gap in the, in the South prior to World War I. But that gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the movement go through Rosenwald schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. And Congressman Lewis, now I have had the great privilege of, I had the great privilege of being in Congressman Lewis as a constituent of Congressman Lewis. I lived in his district for 25 years. Um, I still live in the fifth congressional district. Uh, and he wrote this absolutely glorious um, moving uh, forward to my book about his experiences as in, on his very first day in this Alabama Rosenwald School, all the way through to, to, de to the time of the writing when he talks about how education is, to use his language, the cornerstone of democracy. So of the original 4,978 schools, about 500 survive, only about half of those have been restored. Now, I first heard of Rosenwald schools in early 2015 from a woman named Jeannie Syriac, who originated the role of African-American heritage specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office. And the story shocked me. I am a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I have been a progressive activist my entire life. The pillars of this story, Southern, Jewish, progressive, activists. They are literally the pillars of my life. How could I have never heard of this story? So I came home and I Googled Rosenwald schools. And what I found is that there were some books on the topic, but there was no comprehensive photographic account. And so I set out to do exactly that. So of the, of the 500 surviving schools, about half of them had been restored. And over three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 program states and shot 105 schools. 
This is likely the oldest surviving Rosenwald School, the Emory School in Hale County, Alabama. It is what is known as a one teacher school. And it was designed by a team of architects at Tuskegee led by a man named Robert Robinson Taylor. Robert Robinson Taylor was the first accredited African-American architect. And the design principles that they laid out are reflected on the inside of the Emory School. Large windows on the left to let in lots of light because these schools originally did not, often did not have electricity. On the, on the, on the right, cloak rooms, so dirty outer garments could be left outside the education sp spaces and the spaces kept cleaner. Pot belly stoves vented through brick chimneys to keep this, the classrooms warm. And you see this room divider um, back there. There was a series of folding doors that could be closed to separate the education spaces or folded back to open up the entire space so it could be used as a community center after hours. And these basic principles can, are laid out in 1912 uh, are, are, are become characteristics of this program throughout its entire time. So this is what is known as a one teacher school. This is a two teacher school, the Hope School in Newberry County, South Carolina. It's actually named for a man named Hope, who was the school soup, state school superintendent of South Carolina. And, and during the Rosenwald Schools program, a big proponent of the program, he in fact Donate, he sold land for this school for $5, which was even back then considered essentially a donation. Uh, and the school was later named in his honor. Under his leadership, every county in South Carolina had Rosenwald schools. The school was restored by his great nephew, Ron Hope, a retired army officer who came back to Palmyria, South Carolina, found the school in disarray and single-handedly restored the school. And when you go to Washington, D.C., and you go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, you will find in that school, in that, in the museum, six desks, one potbelly stove, and the original sign proclaiming Hope School, all from this school. So this is a two-teacher school. This is a three-teacher school in Hertford County, uh, northeastern South, uh, northeastern North Carolina. Uh, this school was very is 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 was is very interesting because it, the cupola is extremely rare. This was not a common feature of this program. The Rosenwald program uh, guide architectural guidelines suggested that the architecture should be modest. That was in part to control cost, but also in part so that it did not attract the ire, otherwise known as arson, of the white community. But occasionally the black community would exercise agency. And in this case, they wanted a cupola and they built a cupola uh, and it survives today. So and then you notice that these buildings were one, two and three, uh, were, 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 these one, two and three teacher schools were all white collaborative structure by, structures. By the time you get to the end of the program in the 1930s, they're building one, two and three story brick buildings. This is the Dunbar School in Pulaski County, Arkansas. This is in Little Rock. And this school is significant because several members of the Little Rock Nine attended the Dunbar School prior to walking into history and integrating Little Rock Central High. Now of the surviving 500 schools, um, as I said, only about half are, have been restored, but very few are still in use is it for educational purposes. This happens to be one of them. It's a magnet middle school. But adaptive reuse has creatively allowed these many of these schools to survive in new forms. These are the Pleasant Hill quilters who quilted to and who sold quilts to raise money to restore the Pleasant Hill School into a community center which it is today, and now they meet on most Mondays to quilt. Other schools have become church halls. Many of them were built next to churches because uh, the, the church would, would donate the land or help raise the money. Some of them are museums. This is the Warfield School in Montgomery County, Tennessee, which, is, which has been turned into an especially beautiful museum space. And then of course, Siloam School in Mecklenburg County, many of these schools remain unrestored. And in fact, there were times when I came across schools 
that were in such disarray. Uh, sorry, I was. Uh, I want to show. This is the um, original architectural plan uh, for the type of school that Siloam is. This uh, this uh, com, uh, plan one A. You see there and the architectural references. But there were times I came across schools where it was too late to save them. So I've been very pleased to hear about the efforts of the Charlotte Museum of History to save the Siloam School. I did come across, uh, this is the W.E.B. Du Bois School in Wake County, North Carolina, that as it turns out, and I didn't know this until later, was torn down a week before I got there because it was deemed unsafe. Another school I came across in Virginia had emergency fencing put up around it because it had collapsed right before I had gotten there. So it, in, inherent in this work is the plea for preservation that we must save these incredibly important historic resources and the remarkable story that they tell. But so a part of this work is was exteriors that tell the architectural narrative. Part of it is interiors that tell this adaptive reuse narrative. But the emotional heart of this story was the people that I met. I met former students. This is Frank Brinkley and Charles Brinkley in, at the K. Rose School in Sumner County, Tennessee, under the watchful gaze of a photograph of Julius Rosenwald that has hung in this school since this school opened in 1923. But the story of the Brinkleys is this multi-generational, amazing story of the multi-generational impact of this program. Both Frank and Charles Brinkley attended this school. They both went to college. They both went to graduate school. They both became educators. They have four sisters, all of whom went to the school, all of whom went to college. And the six siblings collectively have 10 children and all 10 went to college. So I, meet, I met former students. I also met former teachers. This is Ellie Damer. Her husband was Vernon Damer Sr. Vernon Damer, Ver, Vernon Damer Sr. was the head of the NAACP in Forest County, Mississippi, Hattiesburg. His father, excuse me, his grandfather donated the land for this school where inside the Bay Springs School. In 1958, the school closed and there was a reversionary clause in the deed. So it reverted back to Vernon Damer. And he turned this school into a community center for civil rights activism. SNCC met here. The NAACP met here. The, uh, when, when, when Vernon Damer would drive African-American citizens into town to get them to register to vote, he would have them park behind the school so they could not be identified by their vehicles and harassed. But in 1966, this uh, drew the ire of the, of the uh, local KKK and Vernon Damer was murdered for his activism. Ellie Damer went to a different Rosen, his wife went to a different Rosenwald school and then taught after college, taught in the Bay Spring School. But when the school closed in 1958 and students were consolidated into, an, into a larger school, she was denied employment because of her husband's activism, and she had to work in a school that was 30 miles away. She worked there for another 21 years. Her, her son, uh, Dennis Damer, has recently restored this school back to the community center that was its heritage in the civil rights era. And finally, I'm gonna tell you the story of the Hopewell School. This, in its final stages of restoration, this is the same uh, school model as the Siloam School. This is inside the Hopewell School. The photograph in the center of this image was shot in the 19th century. That is Sophia and Martin McDonald, both of whom were born into slavery. Upon emancipation, Martin McDonald begins to raise farm animals. He acquires some land. He acquires some more land and eventually acquires 1,200 acres. And when the Rosenwald School Program comes to Bastrop County in 1919, the family donates two acres of land for the school. The school's first teacher is their daughter. One of her students is her daughter, Sophia Williams, on the right, holding up this portrait of her grandparents. Her husband, Elroy Williams, on the left, went to a different Rosenwald School in Bastrop County. Both Elroy and Sophia go off to college, come back, and are, have a career as educators in Bastrop County, and they are now at the tail end of leading this restoration of the Hopewell School 
to turn it into a community center and museum. This is students becoming educators, becoming preservationists, and the keepers of this flame of, of history and memory. And so, you know, I, this is a book of photography. I hope you will spend time with these images. But I came across these such extraordinary stories that I ended up writing a short story that goes with every photograph, or in some cases, pairs of photographs, because I found Rosenwald schools that are directly connected to the Trail of Tears, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, Brown versus Board of Education, embezzlement, murder. And, and so I believe, uh, spend time with these stories because I believe you'll be inspired. I believe you'll be moved. And I think you'll come away a little bit more optimistic about the possibility of change in America. I, I so I wanna, you go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, let me just close on just a reflection on the title of this work. Booker T. Washington sought a better life for his children. Julius Rosenwald sought a better life for his children. The black communities that dug deep to help pay for these schools, even though they were being taxed to pay for white schools, right. they were seeking a better life for their children. And if there's a central message in this program, it is that, the, that you know, they changed the world, that our individual actions matter we in fact can make a difference. And so I think that is the call for all to all of us today to be engaged in the, in, in the process of, of making this country better and making it better for our children. John Lewis writes in the foreword to this book that each of us have an obligation, a mission and a mandate that when we see something that is not right and not just, we have to find a way to get in the way. And so I will close with John with a refrain of John Lewis's most ardent call. May we all find paths to the making of good trouble. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I was going to comment about the, the title. Thank you for, you know, I, I really I was really struck by the title of a better um, life for their children. And and I got to spend some time looking through, you know, you got I gave me a sneak peek of the book and I, I spent some time looking through the pho photographs and reading the stories. And I really was moved, um, not only because I mean, this story touches me personally, um, because you mentioned arson. Um, my grandfather attended a Rosenwald school in Lawrence County, South Carolina, um, called Rosedale. Mm -hmm. And I, I never really w was able to make the connections that it, until much later in my life. But his school was burned down when he was in the eighth grade mm -hmm. and never got to attend public school again. He, he started, mm -hmm. um, you know, cutting pulp wood and and working on railroads throughout Georgia and South Carolina. But it was it's, it was really a, a moving story. Um, I guess how often were schools um, targeted for arson? Is that something that you came across in, in your research at all? Uh, there, there's there, uh, in my research, I came across a number of schools that at some point that, that burned. OK, mm -hmm. there's a school in Kentucky uh, on the campus of um, of Kentucky State. The school that is mentioned in my book is the third school on that location. OK, the first one definitely burned. There is a school in Brevard, North Carolina, where the school that is on that site is the second school, the first one burned. Now, is there any evidence right. that, there, that there was specific arson? I didn't come across that specific evidence. I didn't come across one that says that specifically that there were a group of marauders and they came and they burned the school down. But burning down of these, of these structures was um, not unknown within the system. Okay. And, and so for our local um, listeners, people here in Charlotte, many people um, may not know that North Carolina, more than any other state, um, built the largest amount of Rosenwald schools, I believe, of 313. Is that number correct? I know that you found some discrepancies in yeah. those schools. <laughs> schools in North Carolina. Uh, there, were more, there were more in North Carolina than any other state. And I believe, at least from, from the research that I've done, North Carolina has more surviving Rosenwald schools than any other state. Right. Um, Mecklenburg County I, I from um, had over 26 of these schools built in, in this county alone. Yeah, so one of the things that's striking about this program mm -hmm. is how dense they, they were. So 
um, let's just take, I, 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 let me take that number. It was not uncommon for a county to have say 26 Rosenwald schools. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that the, in North Carolina, the, the average number of school, because you take the schools mid number by the number of counties that had Rosenwald schools. And I think the average is more than eight per county. Oh, wow. A lot of that is because there were not school buses for African-American children. Right. So they had to walk to school. And so you had smaller schools that served smaller areas. And yet a smaller area still frequently had students walking three, four, five miles, you know, both uphill, both directions, <laughs> uh, right. you know, to get to school. And uh, so I th that explains the density. In fact, there's one county in North Carolina, I believe, that had more than 80 Rosenwald schools. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and I think, and again, I, this is really important because um, this month marks the 50th anniversary of Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg school busing case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, there, I mean, there's a lot of connections there. I think that's really important. Um, an another thing that I, I wanted to point out about Charlotte's connection to the Rosenwald schools, uh, many people may not know, um, Professor George Davis was the first black professor at Johnson C. Smith, um, which was then Biddle University. And he was responsible largely for getting the schools constructed throughout North and South Carolina, traveled all throughout the states, um, and, you know, getting these communities to agree to this, this pact, this matching grants. And this became truly a, a community enterprise as, as you sort of um, in, insinuated. It's, it's, it's really a, a touching story. Um, how hard was it to find surviving Rosenwald schools and the people associated with these schools? So it, it, um, it took a lot of work. And in fact, uh, Jeannie Syriac, who I referenced earlier, who wrote one of the, the central essays in this book, tells the story of her trekking across Georgia to find Rosenwald schools. And she was quite fond of reminding me with some frequency, she had to go out and find Rosenwald schools before the aid of the internet. So she would like show up in a community that had one and start knocking on doors. Have you ever heard of this school? Is it might perhaps still around somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, I spent hours at my desk um, w doing uh, doing Google and Google Maps. And and in fact, what I often would do uh, is I would go to Street View. And some of these some of these schools are in, in such rural areas that they don't. There's no Street View. But I would often. Um, try to go to Street View and get a sense of like, what condition is it in? What, 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 what's its architectural design? Might its story be additive? But, but I started out simply shooting the exteriors of schools and I realized that that story was incomplete. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started needing to venture inside and then you have to get permission and then you have to reach out to people and then you end up with this, you know, just extraordinary array of stories that just explodes. And I'll give you, an, I'll give you a really interesting example actually. At the beginning, I was I was still fairly early in this program, and I did not yet have, I had not yet seen a Plan 1A school, which is what mm -hmm. Sinaloam is. And I found the Cairo school, which and I showed you the photograph of Frank and Charles Brinkley inside that school. Mm -hmm. And I found a photograph on the internet of it in restoration with a sign up with all the partners that had helped fund or were participating in it. And mm -hmm. I called the architect <laughs> and said, how do I get into this school? And he said, you need to talk to Frank Brinkley. Right. <laughs> that's how I met Frank and Charles Brinkley. Okay. Wow. So that's, 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 that's serendipity, but that mm -hmm. level of research is, is, is how I found these schools. Okay. So I, I want you to talk um, before we I know I know we have some audience questions coming, um, but before we get to the audience, I want you to talk a little bit about how you develop these stories visually, the, the, the decisions that you made in creating the, the photographs and the art, the, the placement of them. Yeah. So I knew from the beginning this was an amazing story. Right. How do you tell it visually? Right. Well, Early on, as I said, my, my process is to read and shoot and shoot and read, and the reading informs the shooting, and the shooting informs the reading. And early on, I came across this incredible story about the role of photography. So black and white was an early decision. But as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I started out doing exteriors and just realized that the story was incomplete. And then when I went into the, because that did tell the architectural narrative, but they didn't tell the adaptive reuse narrative. And then when I started to meet the people, I realized that that was the emotional heart of the story. But if you look at these portraits, what I tried to do with each portrait is I've essentially kind of crafted the portrait. 
right? There is something in the, the image is not just of the person, it tries to tell the story. So I have Ellie Damer inside the school where her husband went to school, that her that she taught, that her son restored. Congressman John Lewis, his portrait is quite deliberately shot in his Washington office. In fact, early on, his staff said to me, can we do this in the Atlanta office? And I'm like, no, <laughs> because his story is a story of power. Right. And I wanted to acknowledge his power. And that had to be told in his Washington office. Okay. Um, so, and I'll tell you one other, one other tidbit about Congressman Lewis. Uh, I shot this portrait of him October 29th, of 2019. It was exactly two months later that he announced that he had um, pancreatic cancer. Oh, no. But I'm in his office, and we have been working on the on the introduction. We've been talking. I've shown him the photographs, and it's time for me to take his portrait. I've already I'd already set up my lights and stuff like that. And he says to me, he's wearing a breast cancer awareness ribbon. And he said, should I take the ribbon off? And I said, no. And that brings me to this other point that I did not tell any, all the people that sh sat for these portraits, I did not tell them what to wear. I did not tell them what expression to put on their face. Because the, to me, it was a collaboration and I wanted them to have agency in the role of how they wanted to help portray this story. And so that's why I told, told didn't ask Congressman Lewis to leave, did I, to, to told him, I didn't tell him to take it off. Yeah. That was his decision to wear it. It was reflective of who he was. And of course, the irony of that is only apparent much later. Okay. Okay. Um, I know I have more questions, but I, I know we have a few questions coming from the audience. We've gotten a lot of comments um, just really thanking you for sharing your work and how important it is. Um, can we get, uh, we have two questions. I think they're going to be dropped in and to me so we can... Um, so did any of the schools include libraries? It's yeah, uh, they did. But uh, the definition of library is, is not what you would necessarily uh, see today. A library might be a cabinet with, uh, with a couple of shelves and some books. Okay. But um, the Rosenwald program um, in 1928, uh, a new uh, Julius Rosenwald makes the decision to professionalize his ph philanthropy. And he brings in um, a guy named Edwin Embry from the Rockefeller Foundation, where Julius Rosenwald was on the board, to professionalize it. And they, they, they shift in the program from building schools to improving education. And so they, they give supplemental grants to, if you build brick construction, they'll give you an extra grant. If you will extend the school year, we will give you an extra grant. And there's grants in there for school buses and grants in there for libraries. Okay, now wow, because there there was some really nice schools, particularly the school that you um, talked about at Dunbar School in Little Rock. I was yeah. amazed at at how um, similar it looked to the actual school that the the Little Rock Nine actually integrated. There is a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. That's that's very that's that's uh, very observant of you. Um, the Art Deco details. Right. The, our school looks strikingly similar to the Art Deco details of Little Rock Central, and that is because it was the same architect. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So you talked a little bit about yourself as an artist. How, how would you describe your voice as an artist? So I've been a serious photographer most of my life, and about ten years ago, I started down this path of taking my work more seriously and mercifully being taken more seriously. And, but I had to figure out, you know, what, what, what was I trying to say? Well, I have, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I have been a progressive activist my whole life. Mm -hmm. I'm very involved in the not-for-profit world of Atlanta. I'm very involved in the political world of Atlanta, uh, the public policy space in Atlanta. And what I found myself drawn to was stories that were aligned with my civic engagement. And in fact, um, the, the, my first book, uh, without regard to sex, race, or color, is, is, is there's a direct link between that book and this book, because both of them are tied to this understanding that I came to when I was shooting in these abandoned college spaces 
where, where we are, where they they resonate because we are we are we are used to being in these spaces and we have walked these halls and been in these classrooms and these locker rooms and yet we're used to, we don't we are not used to seeing them populated by ghosts. Mm -hmm. And in the research that I did, what I realized I came to realize was that education has been the backbone of the American dream right. since before there was the United States of America. The first taxpayer funded school is created in America in, six, in Dedham, Massachusetts in 1644. That's, that's just over 375 years ago. <laughs> Land Grant College Act creates colleges all across America, 1862. Historically black colleges, mostly in the decades mm -hmm. after the Civil War. The Rosenwald Schools Program, 1912 to 1937. The educational provisions of the GI Bill transform this country from relatively poor to relatively prosperous. Brown versus Board is one of the high water marks of the civil rights movement. And what are we talking about today? Crushing levels of student debt, college affordability, college access. This 375 plus year tradition is at risk. Mm -hmm. And so what, and that's from a public policy standpoint, that is urgent and it is important. And so um, I have been pleased to have been able to sort of make, to merge my civic passions into my art. That's a really important connection that you made there. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, Rosenwald's um, religion, Judaism, um, yeah. how it shaped his philanthropy, because there, you know, a lot of people don't know there's been a, a long um, sort of collaboration partnership between um, Jews and African Americans in this country, particularly a, around education, but not only education. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So Julius Rosenwald, let's go back to the beginning. His parents flee religious per persecution in Germany. Mm -hmm. And he was deeply appreciative that America had been for him and his family and for many other Jews of his generation, um, a safe harbor. But he saw America weakened by how it treated African Americans. Mm -hmm. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's quoted in my book. I believe in America, but I do not see how America can go forward if half her people are left behind. Mm -hmm. And so he is quite explicit that his Judaism, and he's also, by the way, he is a, a member of the congregation of a very progressive rabbi um, in Chicago uh, who helps, uh, who is one of those um, uh, forces uh, behind linking Judaism with, with progressive civic activism, and that shapes him as well. And so he um, is quite explicit that his Judaism plays this important role. And so yes, the Rosenwald, uh, the Rosenwald Washington relationship, their partnership in civic endeavors, their deep friendship is one of the earliest foundations of blacks and Jews in the cause of civil rights that connects through to Abraham Joshua Heschel, who right. marches with Dr. King. And just just months ago in Georgia, mm -hmm. John Ossoff, a Jewish filmmaker, and, Re and Raphael Warnock, an African American pastor, crisscross this state together, together, mm -hmm. and develop not only, not only do they campaign together, but you can tell from their interactions, they develop this deep and trusting friendship. And they, we in Georgia, sends its first Jew and its first African American to the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. The warnock Ossoff relationship stands on the shoulders of Dr. King and Abraham Joshua Heschel, and they stand on the shoulders of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. Right, that's an important through line. I'm glad you um, was able to help us make that connection. Um, let's talk a little bit more about you. So that you know, you're a photographer and um, you talk about, I've read somewhere about your sort of influences as, as an artist and they yeah. don't begin in photography. Um, you, so my, mother, my, my mother was an arts educator, um, as I'm fond of saying, I grew up on uh, being taught about line and movement and focal point, and that was finger painting. Um, but I, I certainly learned before photography about rhythm, which is so um, 
present in the sculpture of Louise Nevelson, of line, which is so um, uh, prevalent in the work of uh, Pablo Picasso, of sensitivity to different colors of light, which mm -hmm. is uh, which is Hopper Edward Hopper's work. Uh, but as I became more focused on photography, one of the people who really played um, um, an outsized role in shaping my view of photography was actually Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. Gordon Parks, uh, because what Gordon Parks, who becomes the first African American photographer at Life Magazine, right. Gordon Parks. When I learned from Gordon, I learned two things from Gordon Parks that were really essential. One is that art can be a mechanism for social activism, because he certainly his famous phrase was that his camera was his choice of weapon. Right. But I also learned from Gordon Parks patience. He is famous in particular for this body of work um, about a family and a, a young boy in the favelas of uh, Rio de Janeiro, mm -hmm. the slums of Rio de Janeiro. And if you go into that story, he goes and he spends days with that family before he pulls his camera out. Mm. And that, his, that story has always struck with me about how you as a photographer have to make sure that the camera is a mechanism for bringing people together, not a mechanism of division. Right, building that trust, right. Okay, we have, I think we have another question from the audience that's gonna come up. Okay, so I think there was a Rosenwald school in Dunbarton, South Carolina that had dorms. It got torn down due to the Savannah River plant. Is the dorm part of a myth or is it true? Uh, I am not aware of a Rosenwald school per se that had dorms, but there are schools that had that where there are related stories. So mm -hmm. for example, I actually two in my, in my, um, there's two in my book that have at least a story around, okay, how do you, how do you, how does somebody who live far away access the schools? So there's a portrait of a woman named Sharon Mitchell um, in my book who attended the, the school, the Rosenwald School in Berea, um, Kentucky. She lived 40 miles away and she would take the train in every mo Monday morning, mm -hmm. stay with her aunt, attend the school and Friday afternoon, she would take the train back home. Wow. There's another school, the, another school actually named Dunbar in Fort Myers, Lee County, that was um, a large, high school and the only high school for African-Americans in the, in the region. And so it actually served three counties. And so the students that were coming over, who the students would, might go back after school, but if they participated in after school extracurricular activities, they would have to find a place to stay in the community. Now, is it possible that there was a dorm, that the community built a dorm somewhere for, for, mm -hmm. uh, for students? Absolutely, but I haven't actually come across that story. Okay. It says, okay, we have another question. What were the grade age ranges of these schools? Yeah, so they varied widely from school to school. The one thing I would say, first of all, is um, most of these schools, let's just say you're, you're two, I'm gonna use the example of, of um, John Lewis. John Lewis went to a two teacher school that probably was, let's say grades one through eight and one teacher taught grades one through four in one room and another teacher say gr taught grades five through eight in another room, that kind of thing. One teacher, lots of students, multiple grades was common. These schools tended to be this combination of elementary, maybe middle school, because if the students went on to uh, high school, they often went to larger schools that had this strangely euphemistic name, which was county training schools. Now, to the white population, that meant vocational education, mm -hmm. but it hides the rigors of the curriculum. And so it was this strange hybrid phrase that was somewhat political in order to create the viability of high schools in these communities. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I, I just have to say how you know, honored I am to um, to be able to share this 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 important work um, with Levine, um, and um, to have you up as a part of this. Um, you know, your work I think really 
it, it, it will turn out to aid the grassroots preservation movements that really begin to emerge in the, in the um, 1980s. Um, to be able to see all of these pictures in one place, I, I think it, it's really powerful. Um, and I, I wanna give you um, a, a chance to, to, to say, give the last words if you have something before we bring on um, Fanny Flono to talk about the local um, efforts to save the Siloam um, School here in Charlotte. Yeah, so I got an email the other uh, a couple of days ago from somebody um i uh, the, we did an event a couple of days ago in atlanta where i was on the sh on the stage with former mayor shirley franklin and a friend of mayor franklin's got in touch and she passed this information on to me and this woman writes that that this has started this conversation in her family mm -hmm. that they didn't know that some of their ancestors went to Rosenwald schools right. and some of their living relatives went to Rosenwald schools and which Rosenwald schools. And I think that that idea of bringing enlivening family history, uh, I think is incredibly exciting. I'll tell you, it, Brent Legs, who heads up the uh, African-American preservation at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who wrote his absolutely beautiful afterward to my book. He gets started in historic preservation by doing his graduate school thesis on Rosenwald schools in Kentucky. And he finds out that his parents bent, both went to Rosenwald schools. They did not know they went to Rosenwald schools. <laughs> and my portrait of Brent is in Drakesboro, Kentucky on the empty lot that held the Drakesboro school mm -hmm. that had been attended, Rosenwald school attended by his father. Wow. And so, um, and yet, that um, so I am I am hopeful that mm -hmm. this book will bring. I mean, my, my work is fundamental. This is an incredible story, mm -hmm. but not everybody is going to go read um, uh, a more extensive history book. Um, right. I'm hopeful that my images will yeah. bring more people into these stories, get them connected to the stories, help them understand this most essential element of our history, um, and. I, as I said, I, 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 if you spend time with these images, spend time with these stories, I think you'll, I think, I think you'll be inspired by this, by the power of, um, of our, of our, of our, it just our everyday Americans to mm -hmm. bring substantial change. And I, I agree with you. It is a fabulous way to bring people into this history. The images, are, again, are powerful. Um, and for those of who would like to learn more about the local Rosenwald School um, a movement, uh, so to speak, the, the, the legacy of, of Rosenwald Schools here in North Carolina and Charlotte, um, the former um, um, longtime staff historian here, Tom Hanchett, has an article on his website, History South. Um, that really details, um, it's, a, it's a great article to get you um, acclimated to what was happening here in North Carolina. Um, so now I think we wanna bring some, um, spend some time to bring in um, Ms. Fanny Flono, um, who it was a longtime journalist, journalist at with the Charlotte Observer, spent over 30 years. Um, she is gonna talk about, she's also on the board of trustees at the um, History Museum of Charlotte and is gonna talk about the um, Save the Siloam School Project. All right, I think she's coming up. All right, I think we're still having problems with the uh, audio here. Um, so if you want to go to, we provided a website here, you can go and learn about um, the project here. Um, and it, it is a, 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 a community-wide effort. The city is behind saving this pro, the school. Um, I think we're gonna try one more time. Here we go. Can, hello. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, been, I've been having connective issues, but it was great hearing, Andrew, what you had to say about uh, Rosenwald School's uh, uh, I am just so delighted that you are actually 
uh, shining a light on this re these real these treasures that exist and the danger that they are now um, uh, in, in they are facing. Uh, and so I would like to talk a little bit about the Sloan School. Uh, I have been chairing the Save the Sloan School project for the museum, the Charlotte Museum of History, for the last two years, and uh, uh, we are really working hard to be uh, among the number of, of Rosenwald schools that have been uh, uh, rescued, restored, uh, and preserved. Uh, the Sloan School is a 100-year-old school that sits behind uh, uh, an apartment complex. And so it's obscured from view, and it's largely forgotten. And as you showed in your book, it is uh, in badly need of repair. And so uh, we at the museum have partnered with community members to actually um, um, make sure that this school does get uh, restored. We want to move it to the campus of the Charlotte Museum of History. And we have now actually been able to uh, raise half of the $1 million that we uh, have set aside to do this project. And so we are really hopeful that the community will join with us in uh, preserving this school. Uh, you can go to charlottemuseum.org uh, slash salon to find out more about how you can be, become a part of this effort. Uh, I have a real personal uh, connection to Rosenwald Schools. Um, like many people, like you, Willie, I have a relative who attended a Rosenwald School. Uh, and uh, it, to my great delight, her uh, comments about what it was like to attend a Rosenwald School have been preserved uh, through the Georgia Humanities Council. Uh, uh, her school was called the Hopewell Church School, and it was located in McCormick, South Carolina. And mm. she was involved in helping restore and preserve that school. So I understand exactly what you're talking about, Andrew, and when you're talking about uh, visiting these schools and talking to the people who've been there, uh, they, can test it, they can testify to the great benefit that those schools have had. And so preserving them will not only uh, help us understand the history of educational inequality in this country, right. but also give us a, a kind of a, 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 a light to see how we can actually fight more toward educational equality today. And that's one of the things that we desire to do with the Salon School. So thank you again, Andrew, for your book. Thank you for this talk. Thank you, Willie and the Levine Museum for inviting us to be a part of this uh, conversation in just a small way. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fanny Filono. Um, we, um, and it's a great segue. We're going to continue having conversations about the importance of, of education um, that Andrew so um, eloquently touched on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, April um, 20th, um, April 20th is the 50th anniversary of the um, Supreme Court's ruling on Swan versus um, Charlotte Mecklenburg um, um, school system. And we're going to have a, a, um, a really dynamic panel to come and discuss the, the, the legacy of Swan that, that will include um, attorney James Ferguson, who was the um, a founding member of the first integrated law firm in North Carolina, um, who represented many of the, the families that um, brought suit against Charlotte. We'll have um, Arthur Griffin, who um, attended segregated schools here in Charlotte um, and was a, a, a leading member of the school board um, while the, um, the, the busing case was um, a, a part of, of law. We'll also have um, Fry Galliard, who was a journalist for the Charlotte um, um, Charlotte Observer, um, who who came to Charlotte a year after the Swan case was passed down, and and um, to this date has written one of the most authoritative books on the topic um, called. Um, a dream deferred. And this panel will be moderated by Pamela Grundy, who is a longtime um, community historian, um, who has also herself, who is a, 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 an education activist and has advocated for educational equality um, in Charlotte. Um, she has also written a really important book about the history of, of West Charlotte called Color and Character. So please um, come back and join us on April 20th. Um, all are welcome to um, listen to this, uh, this dynamic panel. 
panel talk about the history of Swan and the importance of education um, as, as the backbone of, of democracy in this country. Again, we'd like to thank you, Andrew, for sharing your work with us. Um, and it, it was a pleasure. Great to be here, Will. You did a great job. Thanks for, for, for um, sharing the stage with me. And I um, hope we get the opportunity to work together again. Definitely hope so. All right.